Every composer must find that spark which ignites the creative process. A performer looks behind the notes on the page to discover that spark, to blow on it, and bring the composition to life through sound. Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Scott Tucker, Artistic Director of the Choral Arts Society of Washington. And today, we're gonna to look at four short choral pieces by some of the great European composers of the past. We're gonna to try to find that creative spark that brought each of these pieces into being. Os Justi is Latin for the mouth of the righteous, and they are the first two words of the section of Psalm 37 that Bruckner chose to set for this short religious piece. The whole translation is brief and direct. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and their tongue speaks justice. The law of God is in their heart, and their feet shall not be moved. The first thing to say is, that Bruckner organizes his musical setting into an ABA structure. That is, the first line has certain identifiable music. The second line has a contrasting kind of music with imitated sections. And then on the third line, he comes back to that first identifiable music. And then in the final line, he uses music which winds down and provides a kind of tag. Every piece we are looking at today follows this same basic structure. The ABA structure is a common one, and it is used not just in classical music, but in all sorts of styles, including folk, jazz, and popular music. Now let's look a little deeper into what makes this piece unique. Looking at the score, an experienced musician would be struck not by what's there, but by what's missing, namely flats and sharps, sometimes called accidentals. Accidentals alter notes, making them slightly higher or slightly lower than expected. And their use is one of the basic tools for creating surprise or interest in music. Good music is a balance of predictability and surprise. Too surprising for too long, and the listener is bewildered. Too predictable, and the listener gets bored. A good composer knows how to balance predictability and surprise in just the right way. And the use of accidentals is one of their basic tools for achieving surprise and for holding the listener's interest. A 19th century composer like Bruckner passing up the use of accidentals is like a modern carpenter passing up their power drill for an old fashioned hand drill. Why would Bruckner do that? Well, it turns out it was a very intentional choice. Bruckner wrote this piece for a choral director who was involved in the Sicilian movement, a movement committed to the reform of church music. Every now and then in the church's history, authorities worry that music is becoming too complex or too worldly or sometimes too self-important and reforms are then introduced. At times like this, composers look to ancient forms of music as a model and that is just what Bruckner did. Music in Bruckner's time had long since settled into the system of major and minor scales that we use even to this day. So the major scale that someone like Bruckner would use is the same do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do that we all know from the sound of music. 
It's a combination of half steps and whole steps, always in the same order. In ancient music, let's say the 10th, 11th, or 12th centuries, there were not just one or two scales, but many, each with its own unique combination of half steps and whole steps, and these were called modes. Instead of the Do, Re, Mi major scale, Bruckner chose to base his piece on one of these ancient modes, namely the Lydian mode. Listen to the subtle way the Lydian mode differs from the major scale that we are familiar with. Here's the major scale. And here is the Lydian mode. You can hear the difference in the fourth note if you listen carefully. It's higher in the Lydian mode than in the major scale. Listen again to just the first five notes. First the major scale again, and then the Lydian mode. This may seem like an insignificant difference at first hearing, but this small change has ramifications that reverberate through the whole piece, just like that well-worn metaphor of the butterfly that flaps its wings in California only to cause a typhoon in Japan. Surprise and interest are created not by the use of flats and sharps in this case, but by the unusual melodic and harmonic twists that this mode creates. The other ancient tool that Bruckner utilizes to create interest is the use of a long chain of suspensions. A suspension happens when a note is held while the harmony shifts under it, creating a dissonance that needs to be resolved. And then the note moves to join the harmony and resolve the dissonance. You hear how that upper note has to move. A chain of suspensions repeats this pattern several times. Note one sits there minding its own business. Note two comes right up next to it with no sense of boundary. And note one moves away and sits down, only to be sidled up to again by the first note, and so on and so forth. This pattern in sound is a wonderfully fascinating one, and it was used to great effect by composers like Monteverdi, who lived 250 years before Bruckner. Listen to this chain of suspensions from Monteverdi's madrigal, Si sì Chio Vorrei Morire. And now, Listen to how Bruckner uses this technique in the A section of the O Susti. First, let's listen to the soprano one against the tenor one. The tenor starts here. The soprano rubs against it. Unlike Monteverdi's version, which only uses two voices, Bruckner's suspension chain is clothed in the full tapestry of eight vocal lines, making the sound much fuller and tinged with that romanticism of the 19th century. Bruckner's use of the Lydian mode and his use of ancient techniques, such as the long chains of suspensions, were two of the sparks of creativity that brought this piece into being. Please enjoy O Susti as performed by the Choral Arts Chorus.
The next piece is a well-known classic by the Russian composer Sergei Rachmaninoff. Most people are familiar with Rachmaninoff through his piano music. But the all-night vigil, sometimes called the Vespers, is based on a completely different kind of music, namely Russian Orthodox chant. Rachmaninoff studied chant for over 15 years before writing this piece. Many of the movements in the all-night vigil are actual chants. Bogorodice Djevo, a hymn to the Virgin, is in the style of Orthodox chant. Here is the chant which he wrote. This conscious counterfeit, as he put it, sounds like an authentic chant because it shares a chant's basic musical characteristics. The music moves stepwise with no big leaps, and the rhythm is flexible, guided by speech patterns. This gives the music a flowing and peaceful feel. Each phrase of this chant ends with a distinctive little flourish. This repeated flourish gives the listener a, a comforting sense of predictability as it is heard at the end of each and every phrase. Soon though, the music takes a less peaceful and a more dramatic turn. While the altos continue the chant, a counter melody is introduced in the soprano and the tenor lines. This culminates in a very dramatic musical climax with everyone singing loudly at the very top of their range. Unlike traditional chant, which remains placid throughout, this section is a dramatic release of pent-up feeling. It's worth noting that this piece was written in 1915, in the midst of the tremendous suffering that Russians were experiencing due to the fighting on the Eastern Front in World War I. While Rachmaninoff bases this piece on the serene and otherworldly music of Russian Orthodox chant, it quickly becomes an intensely personal expression of grief and sorrow. After the outburst of the B section, the familiar phrase ending flourish from the A section is heard in the alto, and then the tenor. as the music winds down to a conclusion of peaceful calm. The unique spark of this piece is that despite its brevity, it brings us from a sense of calm to intense feeling and back to calm again, all using chant melody in a highly personal way. Choral Arts is pleased now to present Bogorodice Djevo from Rachmaninoff's All Night Vigil.
Next up is a piece by the French composer Gabriel Fauré. This piece, called the Cantique de Jean Racine, was written while Fauré was a student. Like the other pieces we're exploring today, this has a religious text. It is a morning prayer asking God to cast off the slumber of the night and give strength for the coming day. It is a prayer that is both literal and metaphorical. Though it was written when he was only 19, it foreshadows the style for which Fauré is so well regarded and which can be heard in his famous Requiem written 20 years later. Unlike the other pieces we're hearing today, this one has an accompaniment. Let's listen to a little of that first. As you can hear, it's written in triplets, three notes per beat. To me, this sounds like a bubbling stream. Contrast that to what happens in the voices, long straight lines like birds flying overhead. It is this contrast, triplets and long phrases, that it is an important part of this piece. Foray creates interest with the interplay between accompaniment and melody, the yin and yang of opposing sounds which simultaneously contrast and enhance each other. In order to create a sense of direction, though, Foray introduces each vocal line from the lowest sound to the highest, and because this is a prayer. The rising vocal lines call to mind incense rising from an altar. And the alto comes in. And finally, the soprano. In the contrasting B section, the prayer turns its attention to those who are, quote, weary and forgetful of God's laws. This is not a good state to be in, apparently, because at this point, Foray introduces a subtle trumpet call in the vocal parts which are an unmistakable reference to the last trumpet, the Day of Judgment. Stay awake, or else, it seems to say. Even as the character of the vocal lines turns to judgment, the triplets in the accompaniment, they never vary, perhaps demonstrating the never-ending faithfulness of God. Most people find Fauré's music soothing and satisfying. There is a gentleness and constancy in his music, which is a reflection of the man himself, a beloved teacher and friend. His music is subtle. It doesn't push any boundaries of rhythm or harmony. There are no extreme dynamics or ranges, but he brings us on a journey, floating on a gentle stream of sound. Please enjoy Cantique de Jean Racine, performed by Choral Arts, featuring Brandon Straub at the organ.
Finally, let's hear a piece written by another French composer, Maurice Durafle. The translation of this Latin motet reads, where there is charity and love, God is there. Durafle was fascinated with chant. In this case, Roman Catholic Gregorian chant. As with the Russian Orthodox chant that Rachmaninoff employs, the music moves stepwise with no big leaps and the rhythm is flexible, guided by word stress, giving the music this flowing feel. Let's talk about the role of dissonance in this piece, written in 1960, and how it differs from the dissonance we hear in the suspension chain of Os Justi, written a hundred years earlier. The thing that drives a suspension is its need to resolve. In Ubi Caritas, dissonance and consonance are created as equals and embraced as equally beautiful. Listen to the tenor and bass lines in the opening four measures and how they occasionally bump into each other, but because they're heading in the same direction, it's okay and the dissonance is not needing to be resolved. In the 18th and 19th centuries, it was very clear what was consonant and what was dissonant. Notes had to be a certain distance from each other to be considered consonant or pleasing. In the late 19th and early 20th century, that notion began to change. Certain notes ceased to be as dissonant as they used to be. Let me explain at the piano. Centuries ago, let's say, in the ninth century, the only notes that were truly considered consonant were notes of the same letter name. A C would only be consonant with another C, either in the same octave or maybe in another octave. Centuries pass, and now it's not just the C that is consonant with C, but also G, known as the fifth. Now we have root, fifth, an octave. More time passes, and now the third, or E, is consonant. These notes, the root, the third, the fifth, and the octave, in our case, C, E, and G, were consonant. Anything that interfered or got too close to those three notes were considered dissonant and needed to be resolved. No doubt, when you hear these three notes, you recognize them as a basic building block of music, even if you're not trained in music yourself. For a long time, the triad was the only truly pure consonant music sound. Sometime in the early 20th century, this began to change. Lots of systems were experimented with to replace the triad system, but one of the most successful and natural things to happen was for the triads to be stretched and built upon. Since thirds were now considered consonant, what would happen if we kept adding thirds to our triad? Here we have our root, third, and fifth, the triad. Now we add another third and we have this, and then this, and this, and so on. We have all these dreamy, soft, jazzy chords all built on piles of thirds. Now if you take the upper notes and you put them down in the same octave as our root third and fifth, we have notes all next to each other, paradoxically both dissonant and consonant. Or to put it another way, you now have a pleasing dissonance that does not need to be resolved. Durafle capitalizes on this paradox to harmonize the Gregorian chant he has chosen to set, making ubi caritas sound equally ancient through the use of chant and modern through the use of 
unresolved dissonance. Here now is the Choral Arts Chorus singing Ubi Caritas. Ooh. 